Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's the only way I can rationalise how Nordhaus thought about climate is that he comes from this, you know, the neoclassical school. He, he He's writing the Samuelson textbook these days, which is the original neoclassical economics textbook. So he's become the, the custodian of the conventional wisdom. And because you, that is a model which says, well, capitalism can cope with anything, an auto, automatic thing, but well, ca if capitalism can cope with anything, therefore climate change can't be much of a problem. And in looking at, in, in, he, had, he, he first began by attacking the limits to growth. He rab rubbished the analysis they use, completely misunderstanding it, as Forrester pointed out in a journal so article. Walk, th walk through yeah. the details of that, because I think people will find that yeah. really fascinating. Okay, okay. Now, it, what we call the limits to growth are published by what's, called, what's known as the Club of Rome, but the people who wrote it aren't a bunch of hippies or even a bunch of Italians. Uh, they were MIT engineers who developed a whole new approach to modeling complex systems called system dynamics. And they built the world's first large scale model, uh, which basically looks at feedbacks. And what you have is amplifying and dampening feedbacks in a system. So if you, for example, have more food, uh, that is an amplifying feedback for the number of children. But if you have more food, you also have more income and that dampens the need to have more kids to keep you alive later in life. So when you put all these feedbacks together, what you get with rising income is declining population growth, for example. Now, what Nordhaus did was feed that particular part of limits to growth into an equilibrium model and say, look, it predicts rising population with rising income, which is the opposite of what the limits to growth study actually found. So what you have with limits to growth was a, a way of handling feedbacks in a complex system with non-equilibrium behaviour. And I know from speaking personally to one of the authors, Randers, of the limits to growth, they actually thought economists would welcome this technology because it would enable them to escape from having to assume everything happens in equilibrium. And they were horrified and shocked by the hostility that economists showed towards them because what they wanted to do is go back to equilibrium thinking. They didn't they did, they want to stop thinking in equilibrium. They want to make everybody think in equilibrium terms. So that was get rid of the capacity to think in a non-equilibrium fashion, which is what the limits to growth was about. And then over time, Nordhaus gradually developed his own approach based on an equilibrium way of thinking. But his main paper, I want people, you can actually find it um, in, on, pretty easily on the web, a 1991 paper called To Slow or Not to Slow, The Cost of the Greenhouse. And he, in that, he assumed, simply assumed, that 87% of industry would be unaffected by climate change because it happens in what he called carefully controlled environments. Now, that included manufacturing, services, all, uh, you know, retail and wholesale, government, okay, mining. Now, what have all those things got in heaven? They're either underground or under a roof. Okay? So he basically said anything not exposed to the weather is not exposed to climate change, assumption number one. Now, if you do that, first of all, it shows you don't know what climate change is. Okay? And secondly, if you do it, you get trivial numbers for climate change. So he came out in that paper saying, using his calculations, the impact of a three degree Celsius, uh, five degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature across the planet would be a zero, so a, a one quarter of one percent fall in GDP. Now, once so he that's said not that, GDP, that's not annual GDP. That's like one quarter of one percent in cumulative GDP, yeah, it, right? It, if you want, if, what if you, it's basically saying the GDP of the of you know, of the global economy in 2100 uh, will be one quarter of 1% less than it would be if there was no global warming. Uh, and that in terms of an impact on the rate of growth is like a 0.002% fall in the rate of growth, which you can't even measure. And that's what they uh, pumped out. And, and, and like, I'm sure it's Larry Summers, who was one of the experts that Nordhout surveyed for one of his uh, papers who said that uh, he was impressed by the fact that it takes a very fine pencil to tell a difference between an economy with or without climate change or with or without mitigation. And they literally assumed it was trivial. And then that's where their arguments for, for carbon taxes and so on have come from with small numbers because, you know, uh, the worst estimates they gave uh, uh, were, uh, I think, of a 13% fall in GDP compared to what we would be in the complete absence of climate change, when in 80 years' time, we'd be six to eight times as wealthy anyway. <laughs>